the story of the Forgotten Depression. By the way, I'm talking to my publishers. I think it would be a little less self-effacing if the next edition were called The Previously Forgotten Depression. Uh, but as it is, the book is entitled The Forgotten Depression. It deals with the events uh, in the aftermath of World War I, culminating um, uh, in the early 20s. And indeed, the narrative continues a bit into 1930. Um, I propose to tell you a little bit about what happened, um, uh, why it happened, and, uh, and how it, uh, it came to a, a timely and uh, rather prosperous ending. Um, and then to reflect a little bit about what might, how this might all bear on the present day's uh, finances. Um, what happened, pure and simple, was a, uh, a mighty inflation, an unprecedentedly sharp collapse in prices, an actual deflation, and then uh, uh, a remarkably dynamic uh, recovery from that. Uh, events that uh, I think our present day policymakers and politicians would give their eye teeth to, uh, to repeat, certainly the dynamic recovery part. Um, uh, the story begins um, in the uh, late 19 teens. America had entered the First World War, had, uh, had uh, participated in the victory, uh, culminating with the armistice of November 11th, 1918, and, and then what happened is what was not supposed to have happened. In every preceding great conflict, uh, certainly in modern times, uh, uh, the peace had, uh, had been marked by a collapse in, in speculative enterprise and in prices. Uh, peace had meant deflation. It had meant deflation in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, in the aftermath of the Civil War in America, and people had prepared themselves for the same in 1918. But what happened instead was the continued levitation of prices. Uh, as measured, the CPI, which had been rising in the low to mid double digits in 1915 and 16 and 17 and 18, continued to do so in 1919. And people organized their affairs for what seemed to be, uh, on the evidence, a, a more or less permanent state of, of uh, of high speculative spirits. Um, one saw this throughout the length and breadth of America. In Detroit, uh, General Motors, even then the great behemoth of, of American industry, uh, erected the largest headquarters building extant anywhere, I think. Uh, Billy Durant, the president of General Motors, speculated on leverage and with great success in rising shares of GM. In Kansas City, a returning a National Guard artillery captain named Harry Truman opened a haberdashery with his wartime buddy, Eddie Jacobson. Uh, farmers planted fence post to fence post. They, uh, they couldn't uh, imagine um, why prices of their crops would not continue to rise. Um, and uh, in New York City, uh, the largest bank of the time, uh, the National City Bank, subsequently renamed Citigroup, um, lent not wisely but well against the collateral of sugar on the island of Cuba. Um, these were representative of the response of uh, Americans to uh, the price signals sent out from principally Washington, D.C. The, the First World War had been financed mainly on the cuff, and um, uh, the Treasury borrowed, and the Federal Reserve then wet behind the ears uh, was dragooned or certainly enlisted in the public service. It, the Fed, it extended credit uh, for individuals and for other institutions to, uh, uh, to buy the Treasury's debt. The money supply went up, interest rates went down. Uh, there's a great levitation of prices on the back of what was a, a really enjoyable credit inflation. Um, uh, this lasted until it couldn't last, at which point it stopped. Uh, and the stopping point uh, occurred in the spring of 1920 um, in Tokyo, where they traded silk. Uh, suddenly, there was an unscripted and unexpected collapse in the price of silk. Other commodity prices began to buckle. Um, and uh, the world over, uh, the idea began to take hold that, in fact, 
uh, the speculative aftermath of the war had ended. Um, in 1929, a great thunderclap from the corner of Broad and Wall in the shape of the stock market crash signaled the close of one credit cycle. In 1920, there was no such single event, but rather a serial collapse in the prices of, of commodities, um, both at retail and especially at wholesale. Um, uh, nobody had seen the likes of it. Uh, uh, over the course of perhaps nine months, the average of wholesale commodity prices collapsed on the order of 40 to 45 percent. Um, uh, contemporaries term this a debacle without parallel. Now, before going a little deeper into the symptoms of the depression that in fact unfolded, I think I should have a, a quick note on a, a kind of a scholarly footnote, not that I set up as a scholar, but a scholarly footnote on differences of opinion with respect to the severity of this cyclical event. Um, uh, what to call it? Uh, uh, prices down, as I say, 40 odd percent at wholesale. New York Stock Exchange listed equities down 45 percent. Industrial production down 30 odd percent. Uh, inflation, uh, um, no. Deflation, uh, evident in the inventory cycle. Um, uh, unemployment, not then measured, but certainly severe, evidently, in the double digits. Um, contemporaries call this a depression. There is, however, a school of thought that holds that uh, uh, this cyclical event was nothing more than a very, very severe cyclical uh, recession. Uh, Christina Romer, an accomplished economist out west, uh, has uh, made this argument in a learned paper. Um, my line on this is that uh, uh, one goes with uh, contemporary observations, and I will recite some facts and figures that I think support the idea that, uh, that what happened was much more akin to what we might call a depression. Um, uh, what were some of these symptoms? Well, uh, corporate profits collapsed. Uh, what else happened? Um, uh, all the physical measures of production uh, registered similar collapses. Uh, in a post-mortem that the Herbert Hoover-led Commerce Department produced towards the end of the 1920s, um, uh, uh, they had this to say. They said that, uh, let's see, auto production down 23%. Uh, the number of companies reporting net income in excess of 100,000, that was down 45%. This is all peak to trough, 19, 20, 21. Uh, hourly manufacturing wages down 22%. Um, uh, between 1920, 1919 and 1920 on the one hand, and 1920, 21 on the other, um, uh, average disposable farm income. Uh, was down 57%, no small thing in an economy in which uh, agriculture still contributed between 17 and 18% of national income. Everyone either farmed or knew someone who did. This was a terribly dispiriting collapse in the farm economy. So, um, you know, I say, but I have a trump for Ms. Romer, that my trump card is, the, uh, is a song uh, uh, that was written and became very popular in that era, and it was it contained the lyrics, the, the rich get richer and the poor get children. This is, of course, the, the tune, Ain't We Got Fun. I submit this to you, ladies and gentlemen, as a clinching piece of non-econometric <clears throat> um, evidence uh, in the service of the idea that this was some light show in 1920 and 21. So down things went. Um, Massed area. What to do? What to do? Um, does anyone recall the, uh, 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 in Hong Kong in 1961 through 70 or so, there was a, a financial secretary named Copperthwaite, and um, uh, I think it was later Sir John Copperthwaite, but at the time it was Mr. Copperthwaite, on principle refused to collect um, what were macroeconomic data from the colony of Hong Kong on the grounds that someone would put those numbers to use. Uh, through interventions and thereby to stymie the, uh, the spontaneity and the workings of the price mechanism in the colony of Hong Kong. Um, 
That was not the explicit policy of America in 1920, but it was the virtual policy. Uh, economic data were very sparse. Um, and the government uh, actually didn't know what was going on. Uh, uh, the Republicans convened in 1920 and for their um, run at the presidency in the fall. And uh, the word economy uh, did not appear in the uh, platform, except in the context of uh, economy and government. Uh, the administration of Woodrow Wilson was incapacitated, as indeed was the president. He had suffered a stroke, of course, famously while trying to sell his League of Nations out west. And, uh, and the administration of Wilson did nothing in the face of what it really couldn't measure. Uh, the program was to balance the budget and restore American public finance to a peacetime footing. And the, balance, the budget was, in fact, balanced in both Depression years. Uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, then still a novice at making errors, it has become much more proficient at that. Uh, but then it was uh, still in short pants in the policy making department. And uh, uh, it felt, did the Fed, that uh, it should first shake itself loose from the baleful influence of the Treasury. And then it should do its best to restore uh, the price level to a proper peacetime footing. And this entailed some. A uh, pretty severe deflationary pressure. I want you to listen to the to the words of of, um, of uh, Benjamin Strong, who was the I guess he was the Janet Yellen of his day. He ran the New York Fed, but sensibly he ran the institution. And um, and uh, uh, Benjamin Strong was by no means a cruel man, but he was a believer in the. Uh, uh, in the classical approach to money and banking. He, he, he believed that, uh, uh, that if inflation were perpetuated in the American price system, it would ultimately uh, deliver a much greater calamity than what was uh, to come in the aftermath of the boom. So here is Benjamin Strong holding forth in private well before uh, the cycle had turned. It was a rather pro prophetic letter he wrote. But here is Strong thinking about what was to come in American monetary policy. And he writes as follows. He said, uh, uh, he said that uh, he wanted a somewhat changed policy, not the inflationary uh, treasury subsidizing policy of the war years. He wanted something else. And he, what he said he wanted was, um, was deflation. That's what he said. And he said, um, he said he also believed that this must be accompanied by some rather serious losses because our increased prices have occurred in a country enjoying exceptional prosperity in which merchants and manufacturers have unfortunately maintained too large stocks of goods as compared with their foreign competitors. I believe this period will be accompanied by a considerable degree of unemployment, but not for very long, and that after a year or two of discomfort, embarrassment, some losses, some disorders caused by unemployment, we will emerge with an almost invincible banking position. So that was that was the that was the the sensibly speaking the head of American monetary policy reflecting on what was to come. So it came, the storm came, uh, and it passed. And what might account for its passing? Well, you'll recall that uh, just now that uh, Strong had reflected on the outsized inventory positions of American enterprise, and they were indeed outsized and. One of the things that accounts for the brevity, relatively speaking, 18 months of this violent cyclical disturbance and the dynamism of the subsequent recovery is the inventory adjustments made by American business <clears throat> acting in an economy unburdened with excessive regulation. And I want to favor you ever so briefly with uh, a few facts and figures from uh, the DuPont Company. Uh, the DuPont Company was. Uh, of course, was desolated to see the close of the First World War. The market for explosives dried up almost overnight. Uh, it was well managed. They made adjustments. And here is what it looked like top to bottom. Uh, inventories written down by half. Earnings per share from $17 in 1920 to $2.35 in 1921. Sales from $94 million in 1920 to $55 million. Uh, Irene DuPont, who was running the company, um, wrote to the stockholders and said, look, we either face a new normal or we face a cycle. 
He said, I vote for the idea that we face a cycle. He said, in the past year's production, we have drawn for raw material one half of our stocks from our own warehouses and purchased only one half. If every other company with which we did business had done the same, everything would be down by half, as indeed, in his case, in the case of that branch of industry, it had been down by half. So the inventory cycle ended. Uh, people stopped writing down inventory. They started writing up inventory once prices turned higher. Uh, finally, in closing, I want to favor you stock market buffs with a window on what a governmentally unmedicated bear market bottom in the stock market looks like. In 1921, in August, at the lows in equities, uh, the Coca-Cola company was trading for 1.7 times earnings and price to yield on a dividend basis five and a quarter percent. Radio Corporation of America, not then revealed to be America's preeminent growth stock of the 1920s, was priced at exactly one times 1923 earnings. Uh, the Gillette Safety Razor Company, which had sold as many blades and razors in 1920 as it had in 1918, was priced to a dividend yield of 9% and a PE of about five or six. The price mechanism worked. Uh, the labor market worked to, to the desolation of many people who suffered, but it worked. Uh, America uh, came out of it, uh, uh, and the 20s proverbially roared. <laughs>